It is indeed amazing to be here with all of you, and for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is the first time I've ever been asked to come and speak at SURF, and I am so impressed by the quality of this organization, by Matthew and Dan, and the advisors and sponsors who I got to meet a couple of last night. You guys are really lucky to have such an invaluable organization. Um, secondly, as Marnie said, uh, you all gave me an excuse to leave my home state of Alaska. Which, which is lovely and great and one of the best places to live, but where it has also been below zero for so long that I couldn't even remember what I look like without seven base layers. <laughs> so, um, and I finally am grateful, and perhaps this goes without saying, uh, I am here and my children are not. <laughs> um, I guess I could have come here today and talked to you about economics, but that would have been hilarious given that uh, anything I could say, Matthew would run rings around. Um, and I guess I could have come here today to talk to you about all the crazy stuff that is happening in Washington, but we only have 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, so I thought it might be better to talk about why. Why we see so much strange, so much abnormal coming out of Washington. Why do we feel like everything is always spiraling out of control in that city? And what do we do about it? And I think a lot of it comes down to a single word. Uh, it's a word we hear too often coming out of D.C. Uh, it's a word that I believe is at the heart of many of the problems we see in our politics today from our polarization to DC's dysfunction, to the loss of faith that we see in institutions. And that word is unprecedented. You know, nobody should ever want to hear the word unprecedented with relation to Washington. And that's because it's never in the context of a good sentence, right? It's never as if you ever hear someone say, in an unprecedented show of bipartisanship, Congress came together and solved the border crisis. You know, it's not as if you ever hear in an unprecedented show of leadership, the president called on both parties to finally fix our entitlement problem. You know, that's never how you hear that word work in Washington. And if you think about it, that largely also holds true in life, uh, which is hilarious. Usually unprecedented doesn't signal anything good in any context. You know, I was thinking about this myself. You know, it's not as if I ever wake up and say, wow, my son took out the garbage unasked. That was unprecedented. You know, I mean, unprecedented in almost all walks of life is always a problem. Uh, and unfortunately, we're getting a lot of unprecedented out of DC right now. But it's all things like this instead. It's things like the Department of Justice, in an unprecedented move, raided a former president's house. The last House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, in an unprecedented move, blocked the minority picks for the January 6th committee. The current Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, in an unprecedented move, unilaterally removed two members of the minority party from the House Intelligence Committee. A powerful Washington senator just this week in an unprecedented move called on the FDA to ignore a federal court ruling if that ruling did not go the way he wanted it to go. And those are just the headlines from the past couple of years. And by the way, pro tip, don't ever agree to a drinking game over how many times the word unprecedented comes out of Washington. <laughs> you will have to check into rehab, okay? And, and that's very concerning right now because we are witnessing a, a rapid overturning of political standards and norms and a resulting loss of faith in too many of our core institutions. But it's more than just a loss of faith because when people start to believe that there are no standards in institutions, that everything is being done on an ad hoc basis, they begin to fear those institutions. And right now we have huge swaths of the country who are coming to believe, rightly or wrongly, that those institutions are corrupt, politicized, hyperpartisan, and increasingly a threat to American life and liberty. That is a very dangerous place for a public to be, for any democratically functioning country to be. And I would also argue it's at the root of the lot of the polarization that we see in Washington and beyond. You know, the situation is even more worrisome from my perspective because of the current class of officials we have in Washington who seem largely focused on making this problem worse, not better. 
we've had a loss of faith in institutions before, but usually always followed by some bipartisan attempt to restore that faith, okay? The Senate Watergate Committee, the Church Committee, reports by special counsels into the CIA or scandals or government corruption. We even used to have politicians who admitted that they made mistakes and resigned. You know all those headlines about the great resignation that we've been seeing in the private sector? Uh, we've got the opposite problem in DC. <laughs> we've got people who've been that in that city for so long they can't even remember their own names. Uh, today's politicians aren't nearly as interested in restoring faith as they are on doubling down on actions and undermining confidence. You know, I've covered the Beltway now for 25 years, and here's one takeaway, especially from recently. No matter how low someone sets the bar in Washington, the other side is going to figure out a way to set it lower. And back, in fact, it may be the only thing that they are really good at. Uh, this approach, I think, was encapsulated in a line that Barack Obama gave in 2008 as he was running for the presidency. And in fact, it's a line I actually thought was a really reckless statement at the time because it was unprecedented to have a president say anything like this publicly and because it gave license to a lot of the attitudes that we are now seeing in Washington. He went to a, a Pennsylvania rally and he went all untouchables. I don't know how many of you know that movie. And he said, if they bring a knife to the fight, we bring a gun. Uh, let me give you an example of how this actually works in practice, where you can actually trace a direct line from point A to point B in the erosion of confidence in an institution. For most of the Supreme Court's 233 year history, the confirmation process has been pretty fast, pretty easy, and pretty uncontroversial, largely bipartisan. Senators on both sides believed that presidents deserved to have picks uh, of their own qualified justices and that they should be confirmed barring some sort of glaring ethical problem. And for the most part, nominations only needed 50 votes for confirmation and they routinely did. Even high court nominations passed through easily. That began to change in the 60s and the 70s and then fast forward to 1987 when Democrats for the first time unprecedented, engaged in the politics of personal destruction and successfully denied Robert Bork a seat on the court. And just to be clear, he wasn't denied a seat on the court because he was unqualified. He was a former solicitor general. He was denied because Democrats didn't like his views. Fast forward again, you get to the George W. Bush presidency and then we are really off to the races. Democrats, then in the Senate minority, start demanding 60 vote filibusters for the confirmation of any major executive branch or judicial nominee. Unprecedented. That inspired Republicans, when they ended up in the minority under Barack Obama, to do the same. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid's answer to this stalemate in 2013, <laughs> to the stalemate his party created by first filibustering judges, was to kill the filibuster for circuit court judges. Mitch McConnell said at the time, and I quote, you'll regret this, and you may regret this a lot sooner than you think. And indeed, in the last year of Obama's term, after Antonin Scalia died, Republican majority refused to act on Obama's replacement, Merrick Garland, thereby holding the seat open for Donald Trump. Largely unprecedented. And indeed, when Trump won the presidency, and Democrats were blocking his first Supreme Court nominee, Neil Gorsuch, Republicans decided to kill the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees. Democrats responded by turning the nomination of the next no Trump nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, into one of the most raucous, most disgraceful show trials in American history. Republicans responded by rushing through Amy Coney Barrett's nomination following the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Democrats responded by actively campaigning in the 2020 presidential primary on packing the court, imposing term limits, or anything else necessary to forcibly regain control. With Biden in office, progressives took another unprecedented move in its relentless campaign to force Stephen Breyer to retire before he even wanted to, worried that they might miss their next shot at putting someone on the court. Biden then nominated a replacement and confirmed her months before Breyer even stepped down, 
something that had never happened before in the United States. So you have to think, what comes next? Well, here's an obvious question. What's the statute of limitations on that move? Nominating a replacement for a judge who's still seated. You know, nobody's really asked. Could a president nominate a new Supreme Court judge upon taking office, waiting for the eventuality that someone might retire or pass away? Think about it, we don't really know, but that's the territory we are in right now. So we now have, for the first time in history, prominent elected leaders outright declaring the Supreme Court illegitimate, to claiming that its rulings have nothing to do with the law, but rather are exercises in raw power, done at the behest of secret and money and powerful corporate interests, all with the design of stripping America of their basic rights. Is it any wonder uh, that the faith in the Supreme Court is at an all-time low? Is it any wonder that a young man last summer set out with the intention of assassinating a Supreme Court justice? Meanwhile, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has already vowed that if he gets enough votes, he will abolish the Senate filibuster, not just for court appointees, but for all legislation, enabling whatever majority is in office to ram through massive changes uh, in our society on a party line vote. Now, granted, the groundwork for all this partisan animosity was decades in the making, but the time in which it took for us to go from a small carve out in the filibuster for appellate court justices to let's turn the US Congress into a form of British Parliament, albeit without any articulate speakers, has been <laughs> 10 years, just 10 years. That's how quickly we have done this, folks. It's, it's really remarkable. They bring a knife, we bring a gun, they bring a howitzer, we bring a tactical nuke. You know, and that example and the speed is what should really alarm us about the cascade of broken norms and standards piling up over the past six years, many of them coinciding with the unlikely election of Donald Trump. You know, the left's response to that election, and it was a bitter blow to them, was to cast Trump as an existential threat to the country which thereby justified any action in their minds in response to him. You know, the argument was essentially in order to stop the rule breaker, we have to break the rules. And when I say rules, I mean any rules, okay? Uh, senior leaders, the DOJ and FBI took the unheard of, unprecedented step of standing up an investigation into an active presidential campaign based on opposition research provided to them by the rival campaign secret surveillance warrants, human informants. We've been dealing with the aftermath of that horrible decision ever since, we still are. It led to the firing of an FBI director, years of congressional investigations, scathing reports from the Justice Department Inspector General, the disgrace and loss of trust in law enforcement and much of the press corps, and the appointment of two special counsels, one who managed to ignore what really happened thereby leading to an even greater erosion of public trust, and the other to clean up after the first one. And by the way, and you can't make this up, we now have calls for another special counsel to look into what the second one is doing. There is a reason the Department of Justice has, up until recently, exercised enormous prosecutorial discretion when it comes to investigations into political questions. Because absent the clearest evidence of wrongdoing, such investigations have the power to roil the body politic, to create deep-seated fears that federal law enforcement and, uh, is actually not acting as a neutral enforcer of our law, but as a political hitman. And it never comes to any good. Look at the events of the past couple of months. No doubt many Americans were cheering when the Department of Justice decided to raid Mar-a-Lago over classified documents. The first time in history of this country that an administration has raided the home of a former president and a potential future rival. No doubt some were also cheering when Attorney General Garland appointed a special counsel to look into former President Trump. Only, whoops. Turns out Biden had his own little stash of classified documents next to the Corvette. And Garland confronted so openly with being accused of a double standard in this case, had no choice but to appoint another special counsel. 
So here we are in yet another unprecedented situation. Crazy. Both the current president, the lead contender for the renomination of his party, and the former president, a lead contender for the renomination of his party, are under simultaneous investigation by the Department of Justice. I mean, does anyone think this is healthy? This is crazy. And these are the kind of headlines we read about in other countries. You know, the countries we're giving aid to to help them establish their democracy? And yet, we're having them here. It used to be really rare for a department head or a senior administration official to be held in contempt of Congress. Very rare, and usually only after years-long fights of documents. Democrats in the last Congress set land speed records, slapping those punishments on everyone from Attorney General Bill Barr to former White House General Counsel Don McGahn. And, just to let you know how this rolls in Washington, I have heard Republicans already debating who are going to be the first numbers of Biden administration folks that are hit with their own contempts of Congress. And to be clear, Biden officials are going to be lucky if they just get a contempt citation. Republicans, as you well know, are already talking about impeaching Department of Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas. It used to be really rare to see impeachment investigations and unprecedented to see ones conducted in the basement of the Capitol and barred to the opposing party and closed from public view. <laughs> uh, people can have a legitimate debate about the merit of the second Trump impeachment, but the first one was unprecedented and odd in every account. And by the way, set a precedent because that's the problem with unprecedented. Once it happens, it sets a precedent. And you are already hearing Republicans demanding the impeachment of Joe Biden, despite the fact that I can yet see any serious grounds for why one would take that step. Until several election cycles, we had never seen sitting members of the US Congress object to state certified electoral counts in presidential elections, never. Democrats did that in 2000, 2004, and 2016. And Republicans obviously doubled down on those objections in 2020 with some very concerning consequences. Until two years ago, we couldn't imagine the Democrats across the country would nakedly use the excuse of a public health emergency to pressure state election officials and state courts into end running longstanding election rules, to stack the deck in elections. Until 18 months ago, we couldn't have conceived we'd have a president that would utterly refuse to accept the certified results of the election and stand by as crowds attack the Capitol. Until last year, no House majority had ever dared to strip minority members of committee assignments. Democrats did it several times. And of course, now, two of your representatives here in California, Eric Swalwell and, Eric and Adam Schiff, are looking for jobs. You know, that's what comes of unprecedented actions. Until last year, no speaker had ever dared veto a minority's picks for a special commission, uh, committee assignment. Pelosi did it with Kevin McCarthy's choices for the January 6th committee. It is now possible that Republicans are going to set up their own special committees, highly possible. Are they going to let Democrats on them? I think that's a very open question. Until this summer, no special committee had ever issued subpoenas to sitting members of the House, like the January 6th committee did to Republicans. How long before it is routine for majorities in Washington to engage in active investigation of their minority counterparts. You know, the unprecedented, the unprecedented word also applies to the three branches and their inability to do their jobs and to stay in their lane. And I think that's an, another concerning thing that we're seeing in Washington right now. Congress is today barely able to do its job of passing legislation. We all know how this is supposed to work. Every one of us watched that Schoolhouse Rock video, I'm Just a Bill. You know, uh, there's supposed to be committee work, debates, amendments, conference committees between the Senate and the House, back and forth. None of that happens. None of that happens. Basically, all these bills are written in backroom offices by the leaders, uh, stuffed full of provisions, they're rolled out a couple of days before they have to be passed. Uh, nobody gets a chance to see what's in them. Nobody debates them. No one uh, can make any changes to them. And then basically you're told up or down vote, yes or no. 
and then one chamber goes and the other one rubber stamps. Do you guys know how long it has been since Congress has actually filled its statutory requirements to pass a budget on time? 25 years. <laughs> it hasn't managed to pass its appropriations bills on time in 25 years. Um, and I know process arguments can be a little boring, but I really truly believe that this dysfunction is part of the reason we have so much polarization in Washington. The process that is laid out uh, that was in Schoolhouse Rock and I'm Just a Bill, that process is what allows for regular order, committees, debates, and amendments, and it's what allows members to work across the aisle with each other, to hash out disagreements, to forge compromise, to get to know each other as human beings rather than as mortal enemies. And when they are deprived of that process, when they're presented this fait accompli and told to vote for or against their party's product, it becomes entirely about partisanship. Uh, you've robbed them of their ability to actually forge some sort of direction together. And it isn't just the legislative branch that is breaking standards and norms. We increasingly have occupants of the White House who decide uh, that that little standard and norm called the Constitution doesn't apply to them. Uh, Congress is charged with passing legislation, as we all know, under the Constitution, but recent presidents have decided that if Congress won't pass their agenda, that they'll just go around Congress and pass it all on their own by executive fiat or by regulatory agency. Barack Obama passed his health care bill through Congress, but then modified, rewrote, or repealed more than a dozen provisions in it without asking Congress. Uh, when Congress wouldn't pass his climate program, he just told his EPA to stand it up, something, by the way, which the Supreme Court recently just struck down. When Congress wouldn't give Donald Trump the money he wanted for his border wall, he just declared a national emergency and took it anyway. When Joe Biden uh, in his short tenure, Joe Biden in his short tenure has already issued lawlessly, and by the way, I, that is according to several courts, not to me, uh, a lawless eviction moratorium, a lawless corporate vaccine mandate, and a lawless mass mandate, and he's only been there for two years. Now don't get me wrong, I'm a firm believer in issuing edicts in some scenarios. I'm a mother. My children understand that they live in an enlightened dictatorship, <laughs> but I, I'm not governed by the Constitution, at least inside my home. <laughs> Even the judiciary is having its problems. You know, anyone remember the term resistance, the people that were just so adamantly opposed to Trump, they'd do nothing to stop him. There were members of the federal judiciary who openly claimed to be part of that. And in response to his election, they began slapping national injunctions on duly issued, and as it later turned out, according to the courts, lawfully issued uh, executive ex actions and orders. One of the main reasons we have different judicial circuits in this country is that so judges can offer competing interpretations and views and decisions, and so by the time those issues reach the Supreme Court, they've been really thoroughly debated. As Clarence Thomas has noted, judicial injunctions should be really rare. They need to be really rare, especially because they essentially amount to one unelected man or woman in a robe imposing policy decisions across the entire country. And for much of American history, those national injunctions were really rare. Here's a couple of numbers for you. In the eight years George W. Bush was in office, he faced 12 national injunctions. In the uh, eight years that Barack Obama was in office, 19. Donald Trump, in four years, more than 55. Uh, and it's not because he was doing anything any more muscular than his predecessors, but those injunctions set a precedent, which we are still dealing with today. We now have conservative justices, those who used to be opposed to this, thinking, well, if they did it, we might as well do it too. And they are regularly issuing national injunctions against Biden executives' orders. How did we get here? Um, I think some of it is a generational shift, a loss of some of our elder statesmen who believed a little bit more fiercely in certain constitutional and institutional privileges. 
Uh, when I first moved to Washington, I mean, I have to admit, the average age of the senator was like 130. <laughs> and that was a little worrisome because, you know, they needed aides to show them where the bathrooms were. You know, it, it, that was a little alarming. On the other hand, we've gone the other way. Um, it, we've seen a, a very dramatic shift. Uh, the vast majority of senators these days are those that have come up since the rise of the Tea Party or since the ascendance of the progressive wing in the Democratic Party. <clears throat> so we have a lot of members who now seem to care a lot less about protecting their institutions and their rules as they do their party and winning. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with polarization, which in my mind has a great deal to do with gerrymandered seats across the country, which lock in incumbents and allow parties to nominate ever more radical members who promise to blow things up. A case in point, I don't know if some of you know how Congress ended up with this particular individual, but Joe Crowley, a 10-term New York congressman, he was incumbent. He was not what you would call a moderate in the Democratic Party. He was one of the more liberal members of the Democratic Party. But that Bronx district that he served for so long is highly gerrymandered. And it means that it is an absolute lock in a general election that anything that runs with a D after its name is going to win, okay? I think, in fact, Nancy Pelosi said you could run a glass of water in that district, and if it had a D after its name, it would win. So what mattered is who wins the primary, right? And you know who figured that out? A young woman named Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And she managed to knock him off in a primary, and here she is. We only have about 50 competitive House seats out of 435 across the entire country in elections every two years. It's astonishing. Um, and when parties do not have to compete with each other, uh, when they don't have to compete internally really for a, a debate about who is going to enjoy the seat, that is when you end up getting more fanatical people serving. I also think it's a short-term mentality that dominates so much of our society right now, from the news cycle to Twitter to quarterly earnings. I mean, can any of you even remember what happened in politics last week? I can't, and I get paid to do it. You know, it, it, everything is moving so fast. Uh, but one of the consequences is that parties don't think about tomorrow, all right? You know, it used to be that the fear of making a precedent while in the majority, that you would have to live under while in the minority, was enough to make people take a deep breath. No longer. When Schumer announced his intention to get rid of the filibuster for all legislation, Mitch McConnell took to the floor and laid out a long list of the things Republicans do when next in charge if they were able to oppose an agenda with 51 votes. And you know, if I were a Democrat and I saw that list, I'd be terrified. I mean, I saw that list, and I'm not a Democrat, and even I was a little terrified. Um, <laughs> but it, it hasn't changed anyone's mind. They're not thinking about tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's a very different attitude in the world. And I think it's a win-at-all-costs mentality, even when the costs are the destructions of all the things that hold this country together. You know, there's a word I like to use more than norms and standards. I like to call them guardrails guardrails for a functioning society and for an elective democracy. These guardrails are what allow us in a country to have a forum for civil debate. To disagree, yes, and to disagree fiercely, but to do so peacefully. It's what guards against riots and arson in the street. It's what guards against attacks on the Capitol, against threats against Supreme Court justices, against the firebombings of health clinics, rules, guardrails. They also provide stability, continuity, and small c conservative change. America has great passion, and that's wonderful. But our institutions are designed to keep that passion from roiling into radicalism that blows everything up. It is not healthy for a country to change the size of its Supreme Court every couple of years, okay? It's not healthy for a country to impeach every president that comes along. It is not healthy for bureaucracies to routinely end run Congress. It's not healthy for courts to issue national injunctions like candy, okay? None of this is good. And they matter because they are what enable the American people to retain some faith in their institutions. Guardrails, uh, standards and norms matter because if you think about it, they are a stand-in 
for another really important American concept, equality. Equal justice under the law, equal treatment under the rules. Americans want to know that there is one set of rules for how justices are confirmed, one set of rules, no matter whether they are appointed by Democrats or Republicans. They want to know that there's some generally accepted set of standards for when it's appropriate to impeach a president. They want equality in the law. They want the confidence in knowing that the DOJ isn't letting some politicians off the hook for some crimes, but also pursuing others for things that aren't really crimes at all. They want to know that the bureaucracy is a class of professionals who take seriously their duty of even-handedly enforcing regulations rather than some nameless, faceless bureaucracy using their awesome powers via the IRS or the EPA or OSHA to go after some disfavored and not others. They want to know that government, in its most fundamental duties, works outside the lens of politics. They do not feel that that is happening at the moment. Which gets to the incredibly difficult question, what do we do about this? And here's the good news, okay, and there is some good news. I hope this isn't depressing. Is it depressing? <laughs> uh, because there is good news. And, and by the way, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get to the good news here and, and, and also talk about what we can do about this. But our founding fathers, it turns out, we are discovering yet again, were absolute geniuses compared to today's political class, okay? It's like the difference between Albert Einstein and my daughter who can't find her shoes in the morning. Um, they were aware of the potential for this kind of corrosive partisan slugfest. And they did put around the entire system, I'm talking about, some ultimate guardrails. Our constitution, the separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism. And to some extent, that is still really working. You know, and, and we should take some real comfort and pride in that. And I give you just one example. January 6th, all you ever hear are headlines about the person who did this and is being investigated for that and the person that was suggesting this legal theory was correct and, and the Oath Keepers, etc. What you never hear about is the fact that the vast majority of the people involved in that day, the institutions held, okay? It didn't go wrong in the end, and that was because we have such a powerful backdrop, so many documents and so many, uh, such a history to make sure that that didn't happen. Here's the bad news. I think the hyper-aggressive cycle of retributive politics has no simple fix because there's no statute you can come up, no rule you can implement that requires politicians to behave, to knock it off. I mean, that's essentially what they need to do, knock it off. It comes down to having politicians with better natures. Yet at the same time, I would note that the American public has all the power it has ever had, the ultimate power, the power of elections. And ultimately, it's going to be up to Americans, all of us, to demand a class of politicians that once again respect those standards and norms. In my mind, it ought to be a baseline question anymore going forward when you are evaluating a politician. Uh, has the person you are thinking of voting for committed to protecting our institutions? Are they committed to some civility? Are they committed to acting as a leader and not a three-year-old? You know, we get what we vote for in the end, right? And this is a new issue I think we all need to be considering as we go out and make our vote. But I'd note that there are really important things that can also be done outside of Washington, which is why it's a thrill to get to talk to this group because groups like this are just so invaluable in communities uh, in this regard. I know that sitting in this audience are business leaders and nonprofits, local elected officials, policymakers, and there's a role to be played by every one of us in helping to change this around in terms of institutions in general. There are few things more powerful in human society than the power of example. And while we focus a lot on Washington, and by the way, I think we focus on it too much, we need all of our institutions to be re-embracing those standards and norms, to revel in them and to make them cool again. We need institutions that proudly embrace free speech and forums for civil debate, institutions who in their own internal affairs manage issues fairly with one standard, we need organizations that are again focused on the power of ideas and reform, 
rather than winning through brute politics. But mostly, we have to appeal to our own better angels, something we have to do on a daily basis, to take a look at the bigger picture. You know, and sometimes in that in today's environment, that can be really a struggle, and believe you me, I just spent the last six years writing about the Russia collusion hoax. <laughs> and, and I have a lot of people, whenever I go to events, they're, they're very, very frustrated that some of the people that were central to that and perpetrated that have not been held accountable, at least in terms of legally. Um, and I completely understand that feeling. Folks who are infuriated about that. But at the same time, we have to think about this current downward spiral and how we make it stop, uh, which means holding back sometimes in that tit for tat and looking for a better way forward. It means attempting to get through every big decision with an eye toward only deploying the word unprecedented in a very positive way. Uh, and we can because uh, we are still the greatest nation on earth. We have an amazing republic, we just have to keep it. So thank you very much. Yeah.